right. Thanks for the introduction. Um, you have the pointer. Yes. All right. So thank you, um, all the organizers, and thank you especially Olivier, to provide me the opportunity to present you what is probably the most rejected study ever so far. Um, seven journals, seven rejections. Um, we have a problem. First problem is stats. We don't speak the same language. Um, I'm sorry for that. I cannot do anything for that, actually. Second problem is that, unfortunately, we had elite professional uh, AFL players involved uh, from Carlton Football Club, so AFL. And as you know, uh, we cannot design the same kind of studies when you have elite or compare with when you have a student athlete. So um, that was not designed as a study, but it was designed as a pre-season camp with the aim of, of improving performance of these guys. So that's, that's probably the major problem we have. But now the question is how these guys ended up in, uh, in Qatar. So you could think, okay, I'm French, they come from Australia, that's maybe halfway. Uh, we had other consideration of that, that just uh, saving uh, time in the flight. Um, as you know, if you think about AFL, of course, it's a highly demanding uh, sport uh, physically, but as every team sport, it's first a tactical, technic <laughs> tactical and tactical sport. So, um, when you think about the training process and you consider the, the relationship or the balance between training contents and physical fitness, physical performances, what is clear is that, as, as, as we all, all would agree, skill work is still the more important. But if you only implement skill work, at best you can maintain your physical performance levels. There is only in the case of you add some conditioning that, of course, you can expect an increase in performance. But by adding some conditioning, you increase your training load, which is, can be a problem with the time commitment or also just training more, injury, etc. So the, the idea behind this training camp is and discussion with the, the guys in the, at the club, the performance department, is can we get another way to, to be fitter while avoiding an extra training? And this is where comes uh, the idea of using environmental, uh, environmental stimuli like altitude or heat, for example. With this setting, you, we, it's kind of a, if you, you still do only skill, skill work, but you can hope to increase your physical performance, but kind of, kind of a free benefit, because in the end, you get the benefit from either altitude or heat while simply playing and training. So it gets kind of a free shot of improvement in performance. The other clear benefit of that is that, of course, through the acclimation effect, you can expect to be acclimatized if ever you have to train or compete is in the environment of, of interest. So if you think about at least the two environments I mentioned, altitude, hypoxia, or heat, of course, the first physiological adaptation that we might be looking for if we choose to send the Carlton guys into a, an hypoxic environment is to, to think about, of course, the adaptation of the red blood uh, cells. So as we know, it's not that likely, and there's been a lot of discussion of that, is it work, does it work or not? We, st we still thought at this time when we prepared the camp that it could be worthwhile because of this inverse Russian trip between the baseline level and the improvements. So as you know, team sport athletes, they will start with a lower baseline level. So we can still expect that they might have a greater in improvement compared with uh, elite athletes. So let's say based on that, we expected that if we were able to provide some hypoxic exposure to this uh, AFL player, we would be able to improve their performance. The other level of, uh, of reflection was about using heat. So there's something that has been known for, for ages now is that heat can increase uh, plasma volume, which is good also is that we managed to, to verify that ourselves here in, 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 in Aspire. So uh, Aspire Aspeta so it was a really good collaborative work with uh, Seb, who is not here yet. So actually, so it was very um, briefly, like, like uh, you have, we have a soccer team with guys, so from Danish uh, football player, Faroe Island. They just came and they just trained and played for five days outside in Qatar in October. So it was hot, but not that hot, 30, between 36 and 40. So it's hot, but not, no, for us it's, uh, it's, it's okay, yeah, 40. So, and after no more than a week, we observed 
clear and substantial changes, increases in plasma volume. And uh, we thank definitely Chris for the introduction this morning. So I don't really care if it was significant or not, but it was substantial, because if you transfer these changes into a coherence uh, standardized difference, this increase by what about 1.2, which is roughly six times more than the smallest worthwhile change. So it was definitely a large change. What was good as well about this, uh, this study with the Danish players is that we observe like the RPE responses to a five minutes submax run were pretty low and they remain very low throughout the week. The creatine kinase uh, response to games and training remain within the normal ranges. So which shows that just training in the heat is kind of is safe and uh, it was very well tolerated by the players. So based on that, we are confident that uh, training heat is a safe and interesting option for team sports player. What is good as well, also data from the, this, the Danish players, is that performance increased after even within a week. We have a 7% translated into a 0.5 standardized differences increase in your year within five days, with five training sessions and a game, which is, which is amazing. Again, that's more than twice the smallest with white change. So of course, there is no control group. Of course, we don't know if that comes from training or heat or both, but whatever. If you train in a heat for a week, in this setting with non-acclimatized Danish players, they manage to improve by a factor, by factor two of the smaller software change, their high intensity running performance. So that was definitely worthwhile. So based on that, we had, again, I'm thinking about our discussion with the guys at, the, at Carlton. We had two options, and we said, oh, cool, in Qatar, maybe we can do both at the same time. With the idea of combining hypoxia, but of course, in Qatar will be no barbaric hypoxia. Heat, having, if it works, an increase in both in hemoglobin mass and plasma volume, and likely even a greater increase in physical performance. But as you know, this has still to be uh, tested. So these guys decided to take the plane, so I didn't have to travel this time. And so they arrived, they trained, and they were based in Aspire Zone. They used these three pitches, because the FL ground is so big that we have to use three, or at least two football pitches on the other side. So they managed, we managed to find s some space for them. And they slept in, in Aspetar. So, uh, for the final results I'm showing you today, it's uh, the data from 17 uh, players. Uh, and basically, it was more than just, just a camp in Qatar. So they, they stayed with us in Qatar for 12 days. But after that, as a reward of their hard efforts, they, they took them to Abu Dhabi, to one of the best, biggest hotels in the world. And they, have to, they can chill out a bit and relax. So kind of a thank you. And then they had back in Australia, back, um, back home, some kind of three weeks of unsuperv uh, unsupervised training. So they had each of them, they have some uh, logs they, uh, they have to, to train, but that was not with, with the club. So I'm talking now just about the experimental setting in Qatar in Aspire. So these 17 players were divided into two groups. One group is called Normoxy group, another group is called Hypoxy group. Why? I will show you. So of course, Every player, all the team, they trained about, so over the two weeks, they, they did 10 skill sessions outside. And of course, this is something that most of the time the reviewers don't understand. But as an elite and as a professional team, we cannot have the players not training together. So this is a fact. So we cannot have a third group training in a normal uh, temperature, for example. So we cannot do anything about that. So all of them trained together in the heat. Then. Um, all of them did some strength session indoor, of course, no hypoxia in the gym. The differences between the two groups were at two points. First of all, so there was some hypoxia during some of the bike session, and then, of course, during the night when they slept in the uh, normal barrack hypoxic chambers. With that, this group managed to, to get a dose of 14 hours per day. So what about the experimental setting? So um, basically, you see again here the three phases, the camp in Qatar, the camp in Abu Dhabi, back home. And you see the different measurements. So we'll go through one by one later on. So um, the first thing that was Seb's work, Seb Racine, Seb works, and, and Julian as well, uh, and others, uh, a heat tolerance test at the start and at the end of the camp 
just checking at how do these guys respond to heat and check off for acclimat acclimation, acclimatization responses. Hemoglobin mass, just before they left Australia and immediately when they arrived with Pete. And then again, uh, hemoglobin mass at the end of the camp in Qatar and uh, almost a month after the camp back home. And of course, we have also performance measure. I'm going to just show you today the data from the yo-yo, high-intensity high running performance. A yo-yo immediately when they arrive, a yo-yo mid-camp, end of the camp, and a month after. So the first important thing to kind of understand what happened as well is just to check at these bars. It is the training load that both groups um, uh, displayed. So. And also, that's also something that's sometimes uh, misunderstood, is that we can measure training load in team sports. We don't need a bike. We don't need anything. If we use the RPE by the time method, it works. It's valid. So we can publish a paper with this kind of method, please. In the end, whatever this load comes from could be skills, strengths, testing, whatever. What is important for what, what, I, want you, what I want you to, to see today is that the load was perfectly matched between the two groups during the whole camp in Qatar. Even in Abu Dhabi, when they had so much more time to relax, the training load was perfectly matched. Of course, this is probably the biggest limitation of this study, of this camp, or whatever. We don't have proper measure of training load during this off period. But again, think these guys are professional, they are paid, they want to be good, they want to perform, they want to develop themselves. So why wouldn't they do not, why wouldn't they, they, they wouldn't do the, the job? So we, we assume that they did well, and we assume that the training loads were matched as well. What about the heat response test? That's just a short part of, of this data. So just go back, sorry. So basically, these guys, they have to walk for 20 minutes in, the, in 40 degrees in the heat. It was quite humid. And then they have to sit a little bit. And based on that, so you see Seb and Julian, they were collecting a lot, a lot of data to check the acclimation. Uh, I'm just going to present one small part of this, is the sweat concentration. And what is uh, well known when you are used to the heat, when you are well acclimatized, after the camp or after the, the acclimation period, you get a reduction in the, the sodium concentration in your, in, in your sweat. Again, if you look at pooled, so both groups together, the effect, so Cohen of 0 0.9, which is a kind of moderate effect, so was clearly substantial uh, heat acclimation. What is important also is, is we, when we compare the changes between two groups. There was no, the, the, there was no clear differences in the changes. All right, so that's my smaller source wide change. That's my changes. The change is actually overlapping the smaller source wide change. So in this case, and which is, I mean, expected because both group got the heat dose. So there were no differences in their adaptation acclimation responses. Okay, but now we can expect some differences with respect to hemoglobin mass because as you know, one group only received the hypoxic simony. So in this case, you can see on the left, the response for hemoglobin mass and blood total blood volume for the hemoxy group. And here you have hypoxy group, hemoglobin mass, blood volume. So I'm going to go straight to the differences in the changes. So which is interesting, and even more than what we expected, you have a likely greater increase in hemoglobin mass for the hypoxy group. But this increase is observed as soon, at, I mean, immediately at the end of the, of the camp. So after these two weeks, when we tested them again, there was a clear greater increase in hemoglobin mass for the hypoxia group. So the hypoxia effect, it worked, and it worked immediately after the at the end of the camp. Which was even more surprising is that when we checked hemoglobin mass four weeks after the camp, there was still an increase uh, in hemoglobin mass in the hypoxia group. And I know that hasn't been shown uh, ever, and this is kind of a surprising finding. But we can trust the data because in this case, even there were some there were some uh, individual responses. Uh, all the all the, the players showed uh, an, an improvement in uh, in these in these variables. And what about blood volume? No differences in the change in blood volume after the camp. Fair enough. They all received the heat. But then an increase in blood volume four weeks after, as a way maybe to compensate or to maintain a more concentration. 
The last part of the results about the yo-yo test. So you see they were running so fast that uh, I couldn't have them clear on, on a picture. So in this case, um, you see here the India responses, hypoxy group, normoxy group that's pulled together. First thing, again, very important for me, is that if you take both groups together, in a week, so when we tested them mid-camp, in a week, you see an increase of seven times the smaller source wide change, in, over, even in a week. So again, we don't have control group. I don't really care. As a coach, I know that what we've done in Qatar was super efficient because in a week, we managed to improve a lot the fitness. Over two weeks, they improve even more. They improve 11 times the smaller source wide change, which is a huge change within a week. So whatever the reason, I would say, of course, that the heat helped a lot or helped at least, but it was kind of substantial changes. What is nice as well is that if you see that if you look at what happened on a pitch, if you look at the total distance covered or the high intensity distance covered during drills, so they were training with the GPS, and you can see that the distances they covered during the drills, there was always the same drills every second day. You see that the distance they covered on the field were, was, was, was increasing day after day. So they were definitely getting adapt and getting fitter, or at least adapt, adapt to the heat. I mean, I'm going back now to the between differences in the groups. So as you see about the yo-yo, no big changes. Like both teams, are, those groups are showing the same improvements showing the same improvements. But we see that something tends to happen by the end, as if there is a kind of a maintenance. This is the hypoxy group. Four weeks after, they kind of maintain their performance, while this group, so the normoxy group, tends to show a little bit of a decrease. If you look at the differences in the changes, so immediately after the camp, no differences. But four, four weeks after the camp, with all the limitation we have, of course, we have kind of a tendency for a better maintenance of the yo-yo for the hypoxic group. So that's my, my last slide about conclusion. So what we saw with these, uh, with, with these guys is that within two weeks, we saw very large increases in high intensity intermittent running performance, 11 times the smallest of change. But in this case, the, there was no additional benefit of altitude. If you look at what happened four weeks after, again, with all the limitations, we can see that there was still a kind of a moderate delayed effect of the hypoxia because these guys, they still, and that's whatever the control, whatever it blinded or not, in this case, they had some hemoglobin mass. They, were, they have more hemoglobin mass. So I don't know how the placebo effect can affect that or whatever. Uh, the effect on performance is very small and can be discussed with the lack of control. So if you consider the whole and if you put everything, if, if everything together, the alt the additional altitude effects are quite limited to the, um, the, um, the massive effects of heat. So in this case, I will, de I will definitely question the interest of implementing, of adding this hypoxic stimuli when you see what we got from, from the heat. And also what is important, and that's more data on our experience working here for, for years with, with athletes, is that uh, compared with training high, uh, training in the heat, you, you can still manage to get uh, some intensity. So you don't have this uh, kind of can be what, what can be a problem sometime. And also most of the time, especially as long as soon as you are acclimatized, all of us now we, we cope well with the heat and you don't have this kind of issue with the altitude sickness or, or whatever. So this is why we believe in the heat and it's good because the heat, we have it here. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>